Good morning, everyone. Hopefully you can hear me pretty good. Um, and welcome to our presentation entitled Parks Program, Developing an Interdisciplinary Student-Centered Program. I am Samantha Gigliotti, and I am a faculty member at the County College of Morris, which is located in Randolph, New Jersey. I am joined today by two of my colleagues, Dr. Brian Sahatsky and also Professor John Soltan. I should also mention Dr. Michelle Iden, who isn't here with us today, but is also a member of our program. And a special thanks to our past members, Dr. Maria Izaza and Professor Ray Callis. Please note that you have the ability to mute and unmute yourself throughout today's presentation. So therefore I ask if it's possible, please make sure that you remain muted throughout the presentation. We will of course leave some time at the end to answer any questions that you may have. I will now hand it over to my colleague and friend, Professor John Soltes. Thank you so much, Samantha, and good morning to everyone. Um, today we have a really good program to talk about something that is at the County College of Morris, which is located in Randolph, New Jersey, in Northern New Jersey. If you're unfamiliar with our campus, we're a two-year school out of New Jersey. We hope that by the end of our session today, about 30 to 40 minutes, that you'll be able to take home some of these learning outcomes. We really want you to be able to recognize how to create a community and civic engagement project. At CCM, we call this CCE, Community and Civic Engagement, and it's all about experiential learning, taking the lessons from your textbooks, from your lectures, from your curriculum, and trying to bring them out into the real world. Get out of the classroom with your students and really try to have them make a connection with the community. We're hoping that you'll be able to see some opportunities for yourself. Secondly, we really want you to think about at least the early stages of how to develop an interdisciplinary institute that focuses on student-centered activities. Interdisciplinary research and scholarship and pedagogy is what we're all about. The three speakers today are from vastly different areas of the college, and we come together for this interdisciplinary institute because we recognize that our students who are taking a multiple, a variety of different courses, really want to explore different issues that are local, national, and global from many different uh, angles, from many different academic backgrounds. So we provide that through the Parks Program. Finally, we want you to be able to interpret an academic project that considers that real-world topic through the multitude of lenses. We believe that in our courses, in our curricula, that in many ways the lessons that we teach, if they don't connect to the real world, then they don't really have a lasting impression. They don't leave that lasting impression for our students. So we are always in our courses thinking about how the real world can influence the academic lessons that we're teaching and vice versa, how the academic lessons from the classroom can actually influence the real world. You might want to ask yourself today, kind of as an early question, do you ever leave the classroom with your students? Literally, do you walk down the hallway and join another classroom uh, working with another professor? Do you attend lectures on your campus? Do you utilize your library on campus? How about in the community? Do you ever do field trips? Do you ever use um, local libraries and some of the community meeting spaces that are available to professors to use? Have you ever boarded a plane with a student and gone on a really large experiential learning opportunity? These are many different opportunities. For the Parks Program, we can check off each of these and we really find them valuable experiences for our educational experience at CCM. Um, moving forward, we wanted to talk a little bit about how we kind of came to be, and we think that this journey will help you understand in many ways how you can model a similar institute at your own college. A few summers ago, the Vice President of Academic Affairs at CCM uh, looked towards faculty to start to think uh, how experiential learning could be really um, incorporated into different curricula. And we set up a, a faculty summer fellowship where over three Fridays in the summer, generally when faculty have a little bit more extra time, we would be able to come together and learn about best practices at other community colleges and four-year institutions in the morning. And then in the afternoon, we would have team members from different departments, different disciplines working together on these projects. From those conversations several years ago, pre-pandemic, 
the parks program essentially blueprint was created where we had multiple professors working together on a common goal of looking at conservation, of looking at preservation, of looking at parks land from multiple angles. So that's one thing just to keep in mind. It really does take you hitting the pause button on your own lectures and your own courses and finding that quiet time, that collaborative time, where you're able to actually sit with other professors, other professionals, and really start to look at your curriculum and turn it upside down in many ways. From that fellowship, we got the full Project Parks program. It has gone through a name change. It used to be called Project Yellowstone, which we find to be a little limiting because we go well beyond just Yellowstone. That was the initial idea, but now we cover preserved land in our backyard, which is Morris County of New Jersey. Um, we look at state parks. We look at national parks. We're going to move beyond Yellowstone one day. So we found a better, uh, a better name for ourselves is Parks Program. And the impact has been tremendous. You're going to hear from Dr. Sahatsky and um, Professor Gigliotti later on about the assessments and the feedback that we've gotten. But I can tell you that we have impacted more than 1,500 students since those early conversations. And we're really proud that amongst those 1,500 students, we also have many members of the community who are not enrolled at our college, but simply kind of join us on this journey of exploring preserved audience, uh, preserved land. Let's take a look at the next slide, which takes a, a bit kind of at not just the learning outcomes that we want our students to learn, but also kind of like it centers our thoughts. It centers what we do on a, on a regular basis. So we discuss conservation in the national park si system, and we apply this to our own community. So the national park system kind of begins the conversation, but it always ends with our local community. Um, and conservation is a term that, yes, is a very science kind of heavy term, but it's very much shared by many of the disciplines that are represented in parks program. We also try to participate, our students that is, in interdisciplinary forum. So we want our students who might be in my class to also interact with students who might be in Professor Gigliotti's class uh, on the other side of the institution um, on a completely different discipline. We like them to be involved in panel discussions, presentations, lectures, book club discussions. We really do feel it is a failure if our students don't interact with other students that they normally wouldn't interact with because they're not in the same classes, but we try to bring them together into this idea of interdisciplinarity. Um, moving forward, the disciplines that are kind of represented um, and the audiences that we have, we have essentially students, which is like the first and most important of the bullet points that we have. And then I'm going to skip a few and go down to community at the bottom. That's like the second most important bullet point for us. Connecting students to the community, that's what we're all about. How do we do that? Well, those are the three kind of bullet points in the middle, faculty, staff, and alumni, the expertise, the disciplinary knowledge that they have, that really helps us in many ways understand and teach these lessons through multiple uh, lenses. So every single one of the events that you hear about today that we've had successes with, the community is involved because we invite them and we get out into local newspapers and we make sure that our story is being told in the community slide. The disciplines involved, you might want to think for a second, and I'll give you kind of a hit the pause button, of what disciplines would be involved in something that looks at conservation and uh, the national park system. Um, I think most of you are probably thinking, well, definitely sciences have to be included, for sure, absolutely. But we go far beyond the sciences, and you'll see there on the screen that we also have art history. That's Dr. Sahatsky's expertise. And actually, this picture is of uh, an event that we recently held involving art history and a lecture that he gave. Professor Gigliotti, she really represents ecology and environmental science, brings the natural sciences into this conversation. I'm the storyteller in the group, so I teach journalism at the college, and I also teach English composition. Um, many of you probably teach English composition or have a similar class, right? Expository writing or English comp. It's a very common first semester class. We bring it right into that as well. And Dr. Iden brings it into history, and also Dr. Sahatsky talks about history as well. If you look at those disciplines, we have humanities, we have natural sciences, journalism, a little bit of a bridge with social sciences. They're all represented here. And in many ways, if you as a student were to sign up for one of our classes in any of these disciplines, you would be exposed to all of these different ideas 
and lessons across these curriculum. To learn more about this, I'm going to hand it all over to my friend, Professor Gigliotti. Thank you very much. So now that we have a bit of an idea of who we are, who is PARP's program, I want to talk a little bit about what have we done. And while I talk a little bit about what we have done, I want you to think about three things. I want you to think about how is PARC's program incorporated outside of the classroom? How does PARC's program look inside the classroom? And also, how is this student-centered? How does it focus on student programming and activities and experiential learning? So first, I wanna talk a little bit about how it looks like outside of the classroom, but this is also a piece of inside the classroom as well. When we first sat down and wanted to figure out what was going to comprise Park's program, we knew we wanted to host events. And we knew that those events that we wanted to host would be for our students and target our students, of course, but that they could extend to general wider audiences. We knew that we wanted to be flexible. We knew that we wanted to be accessible. We knew that we wanted to keep in mind these themes of conservation and protected lands, but that it was really important that we could have these topics that would be in, of interest to everyone, to engage everyone in the conversation. So what we decided upon was that we would have three major programs, that we would have off-campus events, we have, would have events that are on campus. And then lastly, we would have events that could be done or participated with at the comfort of your own homes, which are our at-home events. Now, all of these events are open to the community and I'll share um, some insight as to what these events actually look like. But we also knew that in our classes that we wanted our students to engage in these activities. So we figured that each one of us could say, hey, we want you to come to X amount of events or a number, uh, reach a number of points to get to these events. And so we came up with something called a 3-2-1 system where most of our off-campus events for which they spend several hours, maybe on a hike or maybe at a field trip site, they would get three points for participating in that event. On-campus events that are all on the CCM campus are worth two, but again, they're outside of the classes, outside in shared spaces, such as the art gallery. And then lastly, you can participate through reading journal articles or engaging in a lecture or book discussion that is online. And that would be one point of an event that's at home. Here is just a very small sampling of some of our events. And on the next two slides, I'm going to highlight two of the events, but I just wanted to share some of these events with you that you can read through. So the first event that I would like to share a little bit about was an event that we held. It was one of our first events, and it was a book discussion of Aldo Leopold's A Sand County Almanac and sketches here and there. Some of you might be very familiar with Aldo Leopold, but those of you that aren't, he is a, or he was a very influential individual that had a lot to do with how we as individuals look at ourselves in relation to the land and how we're members of the same community. You may have heard of the land ethic, which was a particular piece located within a Sand County Almanac. We selected this book because it was so interdisciplinary in nature. It had the historical aspect. It had images and sketches, and it says it in the title, sketches here and there. So there was some art history to it. There was obviously the conservation piece, the science piece that was there. And also it was told by Aldo Leopold and it was his way of storytelling. And so this remains one of my favorite events, truly, because we held it at a local library not too far from the County College of Morris at the Mount Olive Library. And we went way over the time that day. 
Students were so engaged in conversation when the time frame ended for the discussion. We said, you're more than welcome to leave, but you can stay if you want to keep chatting. And everyone stayed and just kept talking about their own viewpoints, their own opinions, how Leopold's portrayal of different experiences they've experienced themselves in their lives. That was one event I wanted to share. The next event to focus on was we had a student-led panel discussion of the New Jersey black bear hunt. Now in New Jersey, we have a black bear hunt that is quite controversial. There have been years that we have partake in the um, black bear hunt and there's years that we have had a ban to the New Jersey black bear hunt. We identified several students that wanted to serve as expert panelists to lead this panel. They prepared for several weeks, became experts in opposing viewpoints. Some of them were pro the New Jersey black bear hunt and some were against the New Jersey black bear hunt. Now the discussion just didn't include those students. It also included the audience. I have to say those students did such a phenomenal job. They were so prepared, but they engage so fluently with the audience. The audience asked questions, they had opposing views, they had thoughts and experiences that they wanted to share that the expert panelists seamlessly answered and engaged with. So that gives you an idea of one of our other events. So this is a little bit of outside of the classroom. And I will say that most of our events wouldn't be possible, most of our um, out of classroom experiences in the programs that we have wouldn't really be possible without our community contacts. Along the way throughout these years, we have developed some solid relationships with different groups, organizations, individuals that have acted as participants, as guest lecturers, have hosted CCM and Parks, Pro Parks Program, and they've been instrumental and so that's a really key piece. We keep mentioning community being really important. So now that I've told you a little bit about what it looks like outside of the class and how we can engage a wider audience, now I wanna talk a little bit about how does this look in our classroom? And I'll give you an example and then I'll hand it over to Dr. Sahatsky who will give you an example of what it would look like in one of his courses. So in my class, I teach sciences such as ecology and environmental. Yellowstone, for example, which is our current park, serves as a wonderful foundation for having great biodiversity, unique systems, and there could be so many different examples that I use in my courses. So here I have a picture on the left of bison and two red dogs, which is the name that is given to the young because of the red plumage or their red fur. And bison is not a traditional example for an ecosystem engineer. The traditional example of an ecosystem engineer would be a beaver because it can shape or alter the physical landscape. Instead, I provide an example that is near and dear to parks program, which is bison, that can alter the landscape through its grazing, through its consumption of vegetation and maintaining these prairie sagebrush and grassland environments. On the right, I have something that is very well known for Yellowstone. When you hear Yellowstone, you probably think of Old Faithful or Grand Prismatic. You think of thermal features. And so in one of my courses, I can go into this example in more detail and talk about how there's this dark coloration in some of our hot springs, like in Grand Prismatic. And what do these different colors mean? Well, these different colors mean that there's thermophiles, these extreme organisms that love living in heat, intensely heated environments such as bacteria and archaea. So this is just a quick sample of how I incorporate things or lessons of Parks program into my class. So I'm now going to hand it over to Dr. Sahatsky. Thank you, Samantha. So as you can see, we're looking at art, right? So in my classes, I teach art and design at CCM and a class like Art History 2, for instance, 
um, I start to talk about the development of romantic landscape painting and the development of the Hudson Valley School um, right here in, uh, around our area in New York. So I, I ask a question like, did you know that artists were absolutely instrumental in getting Yellowstone to be the first national park? And obviously, no, nobody believes this, right? Um, so I, I kind of give this painting called Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone, 1872. This is painted by Thomas Moran. Well, who is Thomas Moran and what happened? Right. Just so to fill it in, the picture to the right was just taken about two weeks ago by us when we were actually out there. So um, in class, I talk a little bit about the artists that were invited on the original expedition in 1871 of Yellowstone, uh, well, Yellowstone Parklands at the, at the time, right, the Hayden Expedition. Uh, so Thomas Moran at the time had never been camping or- Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, Thomas Moran had never been camping, never been on a horse, um, had never seen Yellowstone with his own eyes. Um, so he was invited along with another uh, photographer uh, to accompany the expeditions and to basically chronicle the beauty of the American West. And so at this time in 1871, it was much of an advertising um, idea about exactly how beautiful this could be. And it's, it's worthy of note that not everybody believed about the American West and how beautiful it was. So, right? so Thomas Moran accompanied them. He did probably 30 or 40 sketches on this expedition. And they brought them back to the con uh, American Congress while they were debating this bill um, to make the National Park. And as you can see by my t-shirt today, this is the 150th anniversary this year of Yellowstone becoming a National Park. So that could not have been done without this painting that you see right here. So this was actually when Thomas Moran came back to uh, Washington or Baltimore where he was at. He created this massive painting um, and it's obviously beautiful. You know, it's, it's symmetrical. It's got the colors and, and everything. And um, they took this to Congress and basically used this painting saying, see everybody, this is why we need to preserve these lands. Um, so again, an artist that is absolutely instrumental um, in making actual law changes, right, to conserve and preserve our national parklands. Um, so that's what it looks like and that's what it feels like in my classroom when I am actually talking about history and art parks program and the Yellowstone Parks program at the head of what we're talking about. So, using this painting as kind of a springboard, so I wanted to talk a little bit about one of our just crowning achievements of the parks program, and that would be the Yellowstone uh, National Park student trip um, that we literally just got back from two weeks ago, and we still think that we're there a little bit. Um, so, I wanted to tell you a little bit, we took seven students, and we, we rely, as I'll mention in a second, about very much help from uh, the Office of Campus Life at CCM and other grant um, institutions um, as well. Um, so, we were able to take seven students and the three of us faculty members uh, out to Yellowstone. Like Professor Soltis said, we got on that plane and we went out there. Uh, we held several orientation sessions before and you could just see the excitement bubbling up for the students. Um, so this trip acted kind of as a capstone for a lot of these students um, that you're seeing in some of the photos right here that have actually taken several of our different courses. Like we actually had a student that was taking uh, journalism, had taken an ecology course and took my art history course and it participated in the parks program throughout the years, so call it the last two or three years. Um, so we were able to offer this trip and I just give you a brief rundown of how we kind of make this an interdisciplinary trip for the students, but make sure that they have a great time. Um, so on the first day, for instance, that was my day, right? Capturing the scenery of Yellowstone. Um, so I took them directly to uh, Artist Point where Thomas Moran supposedly painted um, his major picture that got Yellowstone to be a national park. I give them the, the trivia about it was actually across the canyon at Lookout point that he did that. Um, but so we, we looked at a lot of the major um, landscapes that were painted and, and a lot of that on that first day. Um, the second day was uh, belonged to Professor Gigliotti. So we went up to Lamar Valley, which is probably one of the most incredible sites in America or in the world to actually experience and view wildlife safely, of course, right? So when I say spot bears, wolves, bison, elk, and moose on this, we actually saw each and every one of those on that day, right? Um, so that was a very good way to look at wildlife biology um, through the eyes of an expert and through the eyes of a 
wide-eyed tourist. Um, so the third day was uh, belonged to Professor Soltis, and we were really talking mostly about uh, major issues that face Yellowstone today, right? Um, we were able then to bring one of our brilliant contacts, Dr. Shane Doyle, a uh, member of the Crow Nation, and he was able to take us up to an ancestral spot for the Crow people. And um, as you'll see in a second, this was one of the most magical days for the students. It's eye-opening. Um, they in, engaged in conversations about these major events um, and issues that are facing Yellowstone um, and of course did a little bit of extra hiking too through that area um, and then day four um, again we are actually in, Yellow, in Yellowstone sitting on uh, the world's largest volcano. So uh, many of the thermal features that we're all comfortable um, with and we've seen before, like Old Faithful, uh, we made sure that they saw all of those as well. And we injected our science as well, talking about thermophiles and thermal features. And um, so most of the days um, were just filled uh, with all of this. And we had really good um, student feedback from how, how we organized the trip too. And on the next slide, I believe, yeah. So we have a couple of more pictures um, on the upper right. You can see that's the day with Dr. Shane Doyle and students just had such a great time. One of the quotes from the students um, as we got back, I'll just say here, everything we learned along the way, including Dr. Shane Doyle's talk, only further educated me on the importance of ensuring these locations are preserved and respecting the, the land's Native American history. Uh, so you can see, again, it is not just um, surface level discussions um, and kind of say, oh, look at the nice pretty scenery. A lot of the students are taking things that they might not have gotten even in the classroom away from several of these events. And we're so happy that we can do that for them and we're we're happy that we have such uh, eloquent students that um, provide such good feedback for us as well um, so the next slide um, uh, a couple of more pictures we can't get enough of the student pictures um, we like to hear things like this too especially when we're um, grabbing feedback that um, again not to toot our own horn but apparently it was planned out perfectly we did uh, the students did things uh, every day but it wasn't overwhelming um, and of course we did a lot of exploring um, we had our accommodations just directly um, outside of the park and we hit every single corner of that park with our six days that we were out there um, and um, uh, yeah, I think the students had uh, a lot of uh, a lot of good pictures as well. We're still loading all of those pictures together about all of our wildlife uh, sightings too. Um, so, next slide. So in addition to um, the large trip like that, that again acts as this capstone or this incredible opportunity, um, we want to make sure that it's not just those seven students, obviously, that, um, that get involved in our entire parks program. So in the past, um, we're, we're kind of very big on the idea of um, press releases, uh, conducting interviews, things like that, to try to get our parks program name out there a little bit to people and students that aren't directly in our classes to help involve the, the community. Um, we do a lot of letter and flyer campaigns as well. So for instance, um, for our spring 22 events, we were printing out flyers and trying to throw them everywhere we could um, on campus. We put them up on the monitors in the student center, um, actual physical flyers as well. Um, like we mentioned before, a lot of the partnerships that we gain in the community, including the ones all the way out to uh, Dr. Shane Doyle out in Montana, um, all the way to um, several of like the, the conservation centers in New Jersey. We like to get that um, out in the community. And if our name is out there and our program is out there, that helps to drum up a lot of interest as well. Um, and social media as well. So what we've done before is we've done a takeover of the ccm.edu um, kind of Instagram account. Um, and we've had really good results with that um, as it goes to, of course, likes and comments and views and, and things like that. Uh, but we also run our own Instagram page as well. Um, but we'll give you that information at the end of the talk today. Um, so social media has been a very good way to, to reach a lot of the students. Um, so in terms of assessing the impacts of the program, uh, this is really important to us as well. It helps us to create more integral events and insightful events for the students um, and the community moving forward, but it also lets us get this very valuable feedback. So um, we've done things like um, providing worksheets and surveys. Um, the example might be our trip that we just did. Um, we did kind of like a, almost like a, a multiple choice, like an idea of what they know about what we're going to see um, before the trip. And then we provided um, some of those surveys afterwards, a little bit more open-ended about um, what worked well on this 
this trip, what didn't. Um, so we write those into then our assessment reports and those are almost as much for us as they are for the student and community centered events. Um, and they aid us, um, of course, in getting that all important um, things like funding and interest. Um, so the student feedback itself is really what we look at. We have a couple of examples in the next slide um, of some of the feedback from our events. The next slide. There we go. Um, I, 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 can't, I can't read these quotes to you enough. I mean, these are actually students going to the events. This helped me be active and on campus more. Um, so if we, can, if we can do that for the students, if we can actually make them want to be more involved in what we're doing and what the campus is doing, that's perfect. Um, I love the people they got to speak to us. There's something nice about hearing world problems from people who are either fighting for them, wrote about them, or experienced them. Not only are we learning in depth about it, but we are also directed to ways we can help. So again, this is music to our ears. This is what we are trying to do. We are trying to bring these events to them to get these very in-depth conversations and to get students in the community thinking about these issues. Um, and again, the all important thing is how do you get them to change and basically be activists themselves for these issues. Um, so those are really things that we love to hear from the feedback. And of course, we probably get negative feedback, but nobody, you know, we like to read about these ones too. Okay. And then, um, yeah, lastly, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the challenges of something like a parks program. So the number one challenge, as always, um, is budgeting and funding. So how do we actually take the seven students to Yellowstone, right? Um, so we've been very active um, in writing grants and we've been uh, fortunate enough to get grants um, uh, from the New Jersey Council of the Humanities um, as well. Um, so funding has been provided by Office of Campus Life and CCM has been very supportive in our endeavors as well. Um, so again, there's no um, there's no kind of guidebook on try to on how to apply for funding, but we've been able to negotiate and navigate that a bit. Um, challenge would be logistics. Logistics meaning the time, commitment, all right, and investment on, on the part of faculty members, but also all of the staff at CCM that really gets um, all of these things done. Um, and so really that's something that we are, I, would, I could speak for all three of us saying that we are overjoyed to do the time commitment and the logistical challenges, um, but that is something that needs to be noted if you're stepping into a civic and community engagement program like this as well, um, that it takes a lot um, to pull off, of course. Um, one of the other challenges, maybe the student perception, and they come into our My Art History 2 class, and I tell them we're also doing this parks program thing, right? Um, maybe the idea is, oh, well, thanks for all the extra work and all that. Um, the, the idea behind our little discussion, especially with the students, it turns their opinions very quickly, though, right? The idea that, oh, you may be going on a trip to Yellowstone with us fully funded at the end of the semester, you know, so if you like that stuff, maybe. Uh, so again, the idea of switching student perception on that usually is not very difficult, but it does have to be noted ahead of time as well. Um, and then maybe the major challenge that we've faced in the last few years would be the COVID-19 pandemic. So we can look at it in positive and negative ways. Negative, of course, it knocked out our originally scheduled chip, uh, trip for fall of 2020 um, because everything had been shut down. So that's a negative thing. All of the students that were ready to go on that trip at the time could not, right? So maybe we got them to stay a couple of extra semesters at CCM, just, <laughs> just kidding. Um, but the idea of taking COVID-19 maybe as a more positive, um, for one, we were able to shift our thinking uh, a bit on the entirety of the project about how can we make student-centered events and interdisciplinary learning and events, how can we make that equitable for everybody, right? How, instead of always just going to Yellowstone, can we actually beam these conversations into their living room on Zoom and things like that, right? So the idea of making it more participatory, um, that got us to switch our thinking a little bit. And we were able to get um, COVID-19 response grants as well. So we do have to mention that some of those opportunities that were presented to us because of this um, ended up being very valuable. Um, so that was the challenges, I guess, that we've, uh, so I'll turn it back over to Professor Gigliotti and maybe she can talk about what we are going to do next. Thank you. Yeah, so we'll end with where do we go from here? What is next for Parks Program? Well, we definitely know that we're going to continue hosting events. We have seen a lot of success in the events that we hosted to the greater community. We'd like to continue hosting student trips. But when we first started with Parks Program, we had a model in mind. 
we knew that this model would need to be able to adapt, but in our first setup of the model, we figured that we would have this two years where we would have the first year being we would go as the faculty uh, members, part of parks program to a national park. We would develop some research ideas. We would lay groundwork. We would form relationships. We would kind of just do all of the staging, figure out the logistics for what it would look like the next year when we bring students. Also in that first year though, it wasn't just about the research at that park. We would bring that park back to our community, back to New Jersey. And then in that second year, we wanted to continue those programs and then bring students to that national park. Now we started with Parks Program Project Yellowstone, but we knew very much that we didn't want to stay in Yellowstone forever, that we wanted to change the parks. And so we don't know just yet what park is next for us. We are discussing what it's going to look like in the future. But will we be Parks Program Project Olympic? Will we be Project Yosemite or Project Everglades? You'll have to stay tuned to see where we end up next. And of course, we'd like to continue to share our ideas and our experiences to maybe help others think of different ways that they can incorporate what we are doing at the County College of Morris at your own institution. And we want to do this by continuing to present at conferences like these opportunities of today. I leave you with this final slide on our contact information. Please, if you have any questions or thoughts or comments or even experiences you'd like to share with us, we encourage you to email us at parksprogram at ccm.edu. You can also find here our Instagram handle, and if you'd like to follow our ventures, you can follow us at CCM Parks Program. And you can also find if you follow CCM underscore New Jersey, which is our County College of Morris official account, you'll also see some highlights from our recent trip at Yellowstone National Park that Dr. Sahatsky just talked about. So I leave you with, if you have any questions, we're happy to answer them. We have a few minutes left. You can just unmute yourself or you can place any questions that you have in the chat. Thank you all for joining us today. So I have a question. Was this, it sounds like it was a long-term project. Did you work with students for one semester about Yellowstone or was this like we did it over two years with different students each semester and then there was just the opportunity for one group to attend in person for Yellowstone? Yeah, so it was a bit of a mixture. So um, like I mentioned, it was initially intended to be two years, but when we first started right away, we figured we'd probably need three years, you know, to really work out the logistics. And so throughout those first few years, the first two years, the idea was we all have different students in our courses that are getting exposed to parks program. And then we highlighted the potential of this trip in the future that you could apply to go to. Then the pandemic hit, and unfortunately that trip um, that was supposed to take place in fall of 2020 got delayed, and we extended how long we were talking about Parks Program Project Yellowstone for a little bit longer. So really it wasn't just one cohort of students, it was students from our different classes, and oftentimes they were so interested when they took, let's say, Dr. Sahatsky's class, that they ended up then taking mine or Professor Soltes's class afterwards. Also, it's worth note um, that we, one student that was going to attend in the fall 2020 version was able to attend in, because um, she had still taken a class um, with us, was able to attend the, the kind of capstone Yellowstone trip too. So that's, that's kind of a good way to look at it. It's like that she was part of another cohort, maybe two years ago of students, but then this cohort of students as well. So um, there's several different kind of strings of uh, student cohorts that could be involved in this. Um, and of course, our plan is to every two years um, really offer that idea of a capstone trip. And of course that owes to us being a two year school too. So we would expect that for students that have been with us for the four semesters and maybe taken one, two, three, four of our classes between um, the cohort of our faculty here, um, that they would almost get this rewarding experience too. But we, yeah, it's, it's supposed to be a two year kind of program for them to, to really um, go through, yeah.
Thanks. All the um, interdisciplinary things I've done with other faculty were always semester based and that's why I was intrigued mm -hmm. by how you pulled it off to keep it going. <laughs> I would just add the, we attempt, I think we think in an ideal world, we would tell people that they're going on this unbelievable capstone experience in the fall semester, and then they go on the experience in the spring. Um, we, but it didn't work out this time because we got the green light um, to go um, um, pretty close to the trip time. So that's one thing to think about maybe for your own college. Ideally, you would like a year to orientate and really educate the students who would be going. But, um, you know, any college also sees turnover in students, and you can't always guarantee that a student that you offer a trip to in the fall will be there in the spring, too. So sometimes we are, we have to be semesterly like yourself. Thank you for the question. Does anybody else have any questions? Well, if not, we thank you again for listening to our talk. We hope you enjoyed it and you can bring something back to your institution. Thanks and have a great rest of the day at today's conference. Thanks so much, everybody. Yeah, for the question in the chat, um, I would love to have camped, of course, right? But we we actually got accommodations just outside, so essentially it's in the Air and B Airbnb type of realm. Um, so we we were able to do that, and we kind of needed that as well with a, a group like the amount of seven students plus three faculty members. Um, it would kind of be difficult to camp. Um, I would be. That I think opens us up to a little bit of liability issues too, if we were kind of um, doing that. So. Maybe a little bit closer to home if we had things like uh, field trip ideas where we could do an overnight camp. Um, but yeah, we we thought that we definitely needed to go with real accommodations, <laughs> hotel-ish accommodations. Yeah, I could see that. Uh, was yeah? Did you start locally, like uh, going to national parks, maybe in Maine or you know closer reach? Uh, yeah, reach well, Maine? it's it's a little. Yeah, I guess it's a little bit of an interesting conversation because there is the idea if we want to make like our capstone trip to, trip to like Acadia in Maine, well, I mean, the students could almost go there on their own. So we wanted to, that's why we kind of started out west a little bit and we kind of framed some of these trips as this is a once in a lifetime opportunity, right? So like you, you might never be able to go out to the west coast as far as like Washington or Montana or whatever it is. So. So we started kind of looking big and thinking big with that rather than kind of some of the local, but our field trips and events that we sometimes do in this area are definitely talking about that. So like the Morristown Historical Park right over here, the Great Swamp, I think it's not a national rec area, but I think it's a state rec area as well. So yeah, we we can go to a lot of those things directly you know, from, from here and from campus. So we frame those as like those smaller, like three point, off campus events for our classes. So we can kind of meld it together. So we can do those like local events going places, but then yeah, for the capstone thing, we really wanted to try to think as big as we could, as long as funding and logistics worked out for us. So yeah, so we're, we're thinking we'll stay with that thinking big approach. Um, it's not like Acadia is really interesting too, and, and that would be something that we could go to um, as well. But yeah, as long as we can go to places like maybe Yosemite in, in California, we will try. So. Yeah, yeah, I'm just thinking we have a uh, we have a school bus, um, and most of our students really have never been out of Philadelphia. Um, right. <laughs> so it would be nice to at least you know I've been thinking smaller even I've been thinking you know, let's get them to rural Pennsylvania uh, sure. and get get them out of the city. Um, and, and I'm tying I'm the library director at Manor College. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm also uh, and in charge of a business capstone class. Um, and we have a lot of professors who think along the lines of, of you guys. So um, 
it, we started a community garden to get you know some of this experiential learning and um, you know we, I keep saying we should think bigger so this is right at home with what what I've been saying yeah and, and sometimes it's great to think big too but if if we can't secure larger grant sources you know sometimes for the big projects then that's way out of reach but again when we started this as a directive you know from like our vp saying we we want to do this experiential learning and you know submit your ideas and we'll, we'll see if we can make this happen and so yeah a lot of it is about funding a lot of the whether it's national or local is going to depend on that because yeah we have we have opportunities through campus life. You know, we can get in a bus and we can go to any of the sites that we want to for, you know, New York City, Philadelphia, things like that. Um, right. But those would stay in the, call it one day realm, you know, like one day field trips and everything. Um, we could not have um, been, you know, Project Yellowstone without the grant money. You know, otherwise it's just basically faculty um, going out there and we wanted to make it so student centered. So yeah, the big trips, mean more funding and more grant money um, but i don't think that that's that's not to sell short any of the local trips that you could do as well you know like getting to rural pennsylvania even that's if that's a one day trip or maybe like an overnight camp trip um, or something like that it's doable it you need you need support from your institution yeah and you need the interest from the faculty and possibly funding but yeah and i, and I say do it you know like try to get out there the the field trips that we due to things like the New York Wolf Conservancy and everything, that's yeah, that's like a five or six hour field trip during the day, but those feel like really kind of more all encompassing trips and, and field trips. So those are just, just as valuable. And those reach a larger audience, I would say. So again, if we can if we can afford literally to send seven students to Yellowstone, we can still we can afford to send forty students on a bus over to the Wolf Conservancy and do some of the similar things. You know, like spotting wolves in Yellowstone, spotting wolves. Yeah. So it's really interesting that way. That's fantastic. Well thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, you may hear from me, but uh, uh, I don't want to take too much of your time, but it's kind of fantastic to watch. Thanks. Yeah, no, that's great. Yeah, thank you very much. All right, take care. All right.